This is the Trading Psychology Podcast. This is VP, creator of No Nonsense Forex and author of the book, No Nonsense Forex Trading Psychology. Link down below in the description. And with me always is Rob Reinhold of Maverick Trading. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Reinhold with Maverick Trading and Maverick Currencies. I started trading back in 1997, back in the pioneer days of online trading. And I've been doing this ever since. And I started trading Forex in 2007. We've seen ever since we've been doing this, a lot of feedback and questions in the comments section about Maverick. Um, people are very curious. And what I've learned is if one person's saying it, then dozens are probably thinking it. So uh, take the time now. You know, there's, there's a place where you can go where you can get the majority of these questions answered, right? Yes, and I've actually been pretty active on the comment section. And basically, the comment I've been saying is go to the website. Go to the website, maverickcurrencies.com. If you're interested in looking into being a prop trader, trading Forex and crypto, maverickcurrencies.com. Go on the website. We've got lots of resources for you there. If you're more interested in like stock and options trading, maverickcurrencies.com is going to be the website. Lots of resources there. And then as always, you can come on the comments and ask them. I will try to be as active as I possibly can in answering them. But what kind of questions uh, do both of those websites typically answer for most people? The most common question we have is, hey, what are the requirements to get started? What are you looking for? All that's on the website. Other than that, we have lots of what is our methodology? How do we handle our business? What are the fees? Stuff like that. Thanks for that, Rob. Now moving on into episode seven. This is something we have already touched on before, something Rob and I have both suffered from, but there's a lot of different ways to be overconfident. And I don't think we've really touched on them all. And I think there's one or two in particular that really need a lot more of our focus. That's going to be our focus for episode seven. Now, Rob, lead us off here because I think even though I had my bouts with this early on, I think this is something that has probably plagued you the majority of your career, fair to say? Definitely the beginning of my career. And this is something that you and I, Patrick, we are both guilty of. We both got into this business with big egos saying, hey, we're going to just work hard. We've been successful at other things we've tried. We're willing to put in the work. We're reasonably smart enough to get this down. And we were dedicated and we were all in and we had confidence, very high confidence. And in fact, I had what I now label as overconfident. I've had overconfidence my entire life. Now, let me tell you what I mean by overconfidence. What I mean is that my confidence was larger than my ability. I've had overconfidence in every part of my life. People say, hey, Rob, do you know how to drive a semi truck? Of course I can drive a semi truck. Never, never drove a semi truck before. Yeah, I crashed. Rob, have you ever ridden a motorcycle? Never ridden a motorcycle before in my life, but sure that I could do it. Thank goodness I did not crash that one. I have had some horrific, I've had 16 surgeries in my life, mostly through sports injuries, because I was confident, overconfident that I could do it. And in trading, I went into there with the same mentality that I was going to attack it. I was going to devote all my time and energy. I would work hard for as long as it took to be successful, and I was going to make it. That actually set me up for some early failures that delayed my trading career. Patrick, how did you have that experience? I wasn't the daredevil you were. Um, I was always a pretty cautious kid growing up. My upbringing had a lot to do with that, I think. At the same time, I was always the smart kid, and I always found ways to work smarter instead of harder. Kind of more in my 20s, I actually started to work hard on top of that. I felt like I was pretty much unstoppable. I was a unicorn. You know, I'm going to come into this market and I'm going to not, I'm not only going to find a very unique way to do things to where everybody else is stuck doing things a different way. I'm going to work really, really hard and make it amazing. And so it's, it's really just a matter of time before I turn my, you know, $2,000 into $100,000 LFG. Let's go. Why not a hundred million? That's what I thought I was going to do. We were both the poacher children or the Dunning-Kruger effect. I want to talk about it in this episode because it's an actual scientific effect that happens. We as human beings, we go from the place where we have no knowledge of anything and we have no confidence. And the way we work as human beings is the second we get a little bit of knowledge, our confidence grows and grows and grows until it gets to a point where we are the most confident you ever will be. 
you get to the highest confidence you could possibly get without any real knowledge at all, just a little bit of knowledge. And then you can see the Dunning-Kruger effect. You have this huge plummet. And I've had this plummet. Patrick, I know you've had this plummet to where you realize, oh crap, this isn't as easy as I thought. And you can see that you actually never, ever, ever get back to the peak. You never get back to the point where you were an idiot, but you thought you had the most confidence. It's pretty interesting. Patrick, do you remember your fall from the peak? For sure. I mean, monetarily and psychologically and everything. Uh, now, I, get, I think that peak lasted a little too long. <laughs> I should have realized early on that uh, it's going to take a lot more work internally and externally than I was giving it. But yeah, when I, when I finally had to come to grips with the fact that I didn't find the Holy Grail um, right off the bat, um, which is absurd looking back on it, but that's how I felt. Yeah. I remember that. Like I, I had to sit back and question everything because I had such high hopes. I thought I had found um, a particular indicator. I'm not going to say what it is because it's not super common, but my audience will probably know what it is. And I was like, I, I don't think anybody's using this. I didn't test it, but I was eyeballing it. And I was like, wow, look, look at how, look at how well this thing works. Oh man. Again, it's just a matter of time. So I got so excited. I had all these big dreams. My crappy job became less crappy because I knew I had a way out. And I thought that, I thought that way out was going to be a lot quicker than it actually was. And so life was actually really good. And I had to come to grips with the fact that those dreams were not real. And that's tough, especially when you've been hanging on to those dreams for a good six months to a year. I have personally found the holy grail of trading at least 11 or 12 times. It's amazing oh, how many yeah. times I've found it in my I career. I got you beat. Yeah. The purpose of this episode is to really lay the groundwork because Patrick and I have gone through the process. I started in 1996, kind of dabbling around. And in 97, I made a commitment that I was going to be a full-time trader. It's something that I had always wanted to be. When I was in sixth grade, I had a fantastic teacher. And the teacher was one of those teachers that they just threw the textbook away and they just taught you about real life. One day he brought in a guy from a bank. And the banker came out and they gave us all these checkbooks. And our teacher taught us about how a bank account works and how you put money in and out of it. And we all had these fake bank accounts. And if you got good grades or if you did good things, you got money into your account. And then if you did bad things, you were late from recess or something, you had to write a check to the teacher and the money went out of your account. At the end of the month, the teacher would open up a store and you could buy all these cool, you know, NFL football pens, erasers, cool stuff. One of the things that he taught us is he brought in a Wall Street Journal to everybody and showed us how to do the stocks. And he showed us how to read the stock tables, how to read the name, how much it changed that day. And he just mentioned, you can buy and sell stocks with your bank account if you want. And he made these little fake tickets. I'm sure I was the only kid in there that cared about that, but all I wanted to do was that. And I would study on the weekends when we got the paper at my house and it's something that I've always been into. So when I got this opportunity and I made this commitment to myself, I was all in, ready to go. It's really funny you say that too, because we played the stock market game in school, probably not as um, dedicated as you guys did. I am a lot older than you, Patrick. So let's not talk about that. I'm older than you think I am, but yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it was just kind of like a little passing thing. We did it for a couple of days and that was it. But I was really into it because I loved video games back then too. And I was like, well, this is like a game you can play and make money from it. You know, you can't do that playing Super Mario Brothers. And I was like, hey, this is really great. So I really put a lot of thought into it. Uh, and, I, and I kept thinking about that. And I think really, honestly, from that point on, if somebody said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead of saying a football player, I said, I wanted to be a stockbroker. And I think I probably said that for the next 15 years. No kidding. All because of that little stock market game we played. It is awesome how much teachers really influence you at a young age. And we spent a lot of time in this psychology podcast talking about your programming. And most of it was all negative programming. But there has been some wonderful programming in all of our lives that we received that has really brought us to this point. Let's get back to this path here because the reason for this podcast is to set good expectations for what it takes to be a professional trader where you make a significant amount of money. I'm not saying it's the only thing you do. It's going to be one of the things you do, 
but you make a significant amount of money enough to change your lifestyle choices. Let's set expectations for the path. I thought I was going to hit it big. I had delusions of grandeur right out of the gates. And that hurt me. That hurt me so much. It caused me to push too hard. I over position size, I over leverage. I did everything you could possibly do wrong. And it wasn't because I was dumb. It wasn't because I wasn't disciplined. It's because I wanted it so bad and I was so confident because everything you work hard for, you get in the end. That was my mindset and it really hurt me. Patrick, how did your overconfidence hurt you? Monetarily, mainly. And uh, I guess in terms of things that involve my brain, I've always been confident enough to where like, no matter how bad I would do, I wouldn't quit because I knew it would turn out okay in the end. I really do wonder if a lot of you listening at home are like this too. If you're listening to this on YouTube, I think 100% of us that are still in this business really experienced this some type of this phenomenon early on to where once we discovered Forex and once we learned how charts work and then we started applying a couple tools here and there and we saw how they worked, like we were just euphoric over this to where I think we all had that conversation with ourselves and said, yeah, this is what I want to do. There is a real future here. I don't care if this guy on YouTube named VP said there's a 99.9% fail rate. I don't care. I'm going to be that 0.1% because I really see the light here. So I think we've all gone through that. I'd be really curious to hear some of your guys' personal stories as far as what was going through your head when you first learned about Forex and you first started hearing other people talk about it and teach it and show you how to do things, whether it was me, whether it was somebody else, whether it was price action, whether it was indicators, whether it was fundamentals, whatever it was. I have a feeling this applies to every single person listening to this episode. Patrick, we have a saying at Maverick, and we brought it up a few times in this psychology podcast. Traders aren't born. Traders are forged. When something is forged, it goes through heat. It goes through pressure. It goes through hammering. That is the process of becoming a professional trader. I didn't have the understanding of that when I started. I thought it was going to be smooth sailing, and it caused a lot of issues on the way there. I wanted to start this episode with this overall overconfidence of like getting into trading and thinking you're going to kill it and be great. As VP said, we've all probably experienced that fall from the overconfidence down to the trough. But there's other things that can contribute to your overconfidence. We want to go through that just so you're ready for when and if it happens to you, you know how to handle it. So the first one um, that I have written down, Rob, is demo trading. Not everybody demo trades the same way or for the same length of time. So I want to make this distinction right away. The first time I demo traded, I don't even think I really did that well, but I could always just hit the reset button and I hit it enough times to where I actually started doing really well. You know, if if you just do that enough times, you're going to have a good run. I think I had that good run. And in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm two weeks into this and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving money on the table at this point. So I, I need to get into real money right now. Yeah. You're uh, ready you know, to go. Yeah. Time is money, man. Let's, uh, let's, let's get retired from this restaurant industry and let's do it in the next couple of years. So I did not demo trade for very long at all, which I think everybody knows is a really, really stupid approach. But then there's a lot of people who take a very measured approach and they demo trade for a long time, as we all know, or anybody who's done it. The, the jump psychologically from demo trading to real money is so extreme, you're almost doing yourself more harm than good by demo trading past the allotted time that you set because you're not gaining those reps. You're not getting the experience of trading with real money. And I think everybody needs that. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, this podcast is all about what happens after demo. Because none of this stuff happens in demo. None of these feelings, none of this baggage happens. You have to get in the game in order to feel these feelings and deal with this stuff because this is where you become a professional, dealing with the psychology aspect. So absolutely 100%. Too long on demo trading will not help you. Yeah. I tell people, you know, back test this many years back and then forward trade for X amount of time. But then after that, move on, you know, get into auditioning for a prop firm, get into real money trading, whatever you need to do, you know, you you can do this for too long and you can also do it for too short of amount of time too. So I think that's really important. 
So when you do flip that switch and you go to trade live, you're most likely going in there with a lot of confidence. You wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't be going live unless you thought that you were that 0.1%. You wouldn't. And so you've got all of this overconfidence. You've got this back testing. You've got this demo trading. You've got who you are as a person and you're ready to go. This is where it's so dangerous. And it's why you have to get in the game because learning how to deal with these things is part of the process. It's part of being forged and becoming a trader. Because let me tell you something, your demo testing results are not going to look anything like your real money testing results. Your win percentage is going to go down and you have to anticipate that going forward. Do not ever think your demo testing percentage, win rate percentage and your ROI is going to come anywhere close to what it's going to be when real money is on the line. I think that's step one. I think that's a big reason people jump into this thing overconfident. Maybe they didn't have confidence at first, but they demo traded and they're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm actually pretty good at this. This system actually does work in real time. Okay. Now it's on. Now you actually start projecting. You're like, oh, wow, I just made a 20% return in six months. Well, shoot, four or five years down the road, what is that? Oh my God, that's a lot of money. And then that's the mentality you start with as you transition into real money. And it's no wonder most people fall apart. Yeah, the whole focus at the very beginning is your trading numbers. None of that money comes until your trading numbers are totally, totally dialed in. They just don't come because you have to put in the work. You have to get to the point to where you are not overconfident, but you are competent. That's where you want to get to is competency. And here's the irony. In the Dunning-Kruger effect, you never get back to that high, high level of overconfidence no matter how long you do this. I know lots of professional traders within Maverick and outside of Maverick. And let me tell you, you talk to a true pro trader, they will never tell you that they know exactly what's going to happen. Patrick, how many times have people told you, oh, I know what's going to happen here on this trade? Oh, I'm not a rude person, even though I can be on YouTube. Like in real life, I don't just jump in and call people out on stuff, but I've, I've had to call people out a number of times on this. But they're like, oh, I've been trading for 25 years. And, you know, when, when I see this thing happen, you know, in, in the news or on a chart, you know, I can pretty much say with certainty that this is going to happen next. When I see X, I pretty much know Y is coming. And I'm like, that is the biggest load of horse shit I've ever heard. I, I'm like, please save it. All right. I see right through all that. But yeah, I, I don't know why that triggered a rant in my head, Rob, but yeah, I know people like that, that they say they can pretty much just predict the market by what they've seen due to their, their experience. I don't know why it gets me as much as it does, but every time somebody says that, I feel the need to jump in and correct them. Well, let me trump your rant because your rant was pleasant. I will be ranting at a huge level here. Here we go. Cannot stand. Yeah, here we go. I have talked with lots of people about trading, lots of our traders. I will not let this go. Whenever I'm having a talk with a trader and they're talking, we're talking about stuff and they say, well, Rob, I know that this stock's going to go from me. I said, whoa, 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 hold on. What did you say? They said, well, Rob, I know that this is going to happen here. And this is what I always say. And excuse my language, but I say this for a reason. I say, you don't know shit. And I get very belligerent about it because the thought that you know what's going to happen in a market that's full of lots of randomness and full of the opportunity of news coming out at any point at any time that could cause things to happen. The audacity for you to say that you know, I jump all over that. Whenever you talk to me or whenever I talk to one of my traders, if they say, I know I don't let it go, I jump on them and I say, look, you cannot use terms like I know because what that does in your mind it makes it a certainty. And now all of a sudden, there's not a chance that you might be wrong because it's a certainty in your brain. You have to use things like the odds are that it's going to do this, or it's done this most of the times in the past. So that's why I think it's going to do this. You can use those kind of terms because all of a sudden that doesn't cement that certainty in your brain. It gives you the opportunity to possibly be wrong. Part of this overconfident thinking, you know, in a market that is random a lot of times is absolutely setting yourself up for failure. 
I need you to check your thoughts, check your speech. Whenever you hear yourself say that you know something's going to happen, I want you to rant on yourself just like I ranted on you because that is setting yourself up for failure. You don't know shit. Okay, rant over. I'm back to being pleasant. I think it really comes down to this one thing that I do know. You don't get better or worse at trading. That's not a real thing. You only get better or worse at creating systems and following systems. The creating system, the nuts and bolts stuff is the technical analysis, the money management, everything like that. Following the system is everything we talk about on this podcast. And that's all it comes down to. You get better at creating systems. And then once you've done that, you get better at following them. And that's all it is. That's all that happened to me. I'm sure that's all that happened to you. And that's why we are where we are right now. And that's why some of the greats are where they are right now. And it didn't matter how confident they were. The only thing confidence might help you in is keeping yourself going when things get bad. I think you can actually use that as a positive. One of the things I love to talk about with our traders at the end of every year, we close up the books at Maverick and we say, okay, great job. We make sure all the payouts have been done. And then at the first of the year, I always have a meeting with all of our traders says, okay, look, the market doesn't care what you did last year or last month. It doesn't care. This moment forward, we are equal because I could be total, total shit next month. And you who were total shit last month could be fantastic this month. So I totally agree with you. At any one point, we all have the capability to be really good or really bad. The market is going to do what it does. I say the market is a wild animal. We step into the animal cage. We have no control. That is the one thing I really want everyone to take away from this episode. To truly get to the point where you know that you don't know shit. And I know that's a weird thing to say because the whole point of not knowing shit is admitting you don't know shit. But to know that at any time when you're trading, anything can happen. News could come out. The Fed could say this unexpectedly. Anything could happen. Once you get rid of the illusion that you know, and now you're just trading because, look, I have no idea what's going to happen over the next 24 hours, but my models say that this is the trade I should take. And I'm going to manage my risk because it could go horribly bad at any time. And I'm going to let this thing run as far as I possibly can that my system will allow because I don't know that it could possibly go really right. This could be the greatest trade of all time. You just don't know. That's it. If you can go into every single situation, treating all trades as the best or the worst trade ever, you're going to do great. Yeah. So I'm getting excited here, Rob, because I want to cut in because that's so right. And it took me a while to learn this too, because you're absolutely right. There's a movie called With Honors. And the only reason I remember this, like from way back in 92, is a Joe Pesci movie where he was a bum that happened to get into Harvard. Do you remember this at all? I never saw it. Okay. The one thing he said, and I think it was like the climax of the movie, you know, you have these really, you know, know it all blowhard professors, obviously at Harvard, or at least that's how the stereotype goes. He got up and he said, the one thing that makes me so smart, the one thing that makes me able to get into Harvard, the one thing that makes me a genius is the fact that I know that I don't know nothing at all, or I don't know any, I don't know how he phrased it, but it was to that effect. That goes along with what you were saying. And overconfidence is the opposite of that because that is you saying, not only am I a great trader, which to me is not even a thing, but that you have the ability to be amazing at something that really comes down to just randomness. And all you can do at the end of the day is learn how to create a great system and learn how to follow a great system. And confidence doesn't even really play a part in that. It's so binary. You just have to do those two things. And market direction doesn't matter. Volatility doesn't matter. None of it matters because it's going to do its own thing. It's going to go up, down, sideways. It's going to do everything. Your system is what matters. We can't control it. Yeah, we, we've gone through, you know, my people are trend traders. We went through four years of very much below average volatility. I remember those years. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't that long ago, was it? <laughs> but a lot of us came out the other side okay. We didn't come out rich, but we came out with our heads above water. And that's all we really need because, you know, as we all know, things change. And they have. we've seen that in 2022. It just comes down to creating a system and following it. That's it. You know, whether you think you're going to be good at it or not doesn't really mean anything. It didn't for me. 
It didn't for you. It, it did not factor into our success or our results at all. Well, actually, thinking you're going to be really good at it might actually hurt you. It's so good to go into this whole thing humble and ready to go and just understand the process. And that's really what this episode is all about, is to get everyone in the right mindset, wherever you are in your progress, whether you're one, you're three, you're seven, wherever you are just starting out. If you can get yourself in the mindset early, early on that you don't know shit, I guess that is the motto of this episode. You don't know shit. And then you are going to make trades with no expectation that they're winners or losers. You're just going to make them because your system says so. The faster you can get to that point, the faster you're going to be a pro. It's it. And if you don't embrace this humility now, the market's going to do it for you. So you might as well do it now and save your money. So true. On that note, don't be confident because you don't know shit. Be humble because the market will humble you on your own. You will definitely be humbled one way or the other. Yeah. One's going to cost you some money. One's going to cost you some pride. I'd choose the one with the pride. Yeah. You know, it's like, this isn't the most uplifting episode in the world, but it's real, you know, and it's, it's a big landmine that not only have Rob and I both hit, but a lot of you have probably hit in the past. We don't want you to keep hitting it over and over. And for brand new traders, we don't want you to hit it ever. So if you can just enter this with the right frame of mind or kind of hit the reset button and then enter this with the right frame of mind, I think you're going to do really well going forward because you have overcome something that takes a lot of people a very long time to figure out. And some people never do. Patrick, I want to share one last story with people. Now, I know that right now, we have these flat screen monitors with hardly any border around them. But when I started trading back in the 90s, we had these really big monitors that were, you know, like 15 inches deep and 15 inches wide. And they had this huge border around the screen, probably about two inches of border. And about one or two years into my trading, I was frustrated with me making some of the same mistakes. So I went and bought a label maker and I actually printed out all my mistakes I'd make like, hey, don't move your stop. And I put that on the computer monitor to where I actually had to look at the sticker, read, don't move your stops before I went and moved my stop. And I remember that I actually had a sticker on my monitor that literally said, you don't know shit. So this is something that I've been doing for years and years and years. If you need to do this for yourself, write a sticky note, put it on your monitor to where you are remembered. Hey, you don't know anything. And if you have any other problems that you keep falling into, Put those stickers on your monitors to where you have to read those stickers before you screw it up. It's going to help. And don't feel like that's crazy. This is a big step in your overall maturation because this is you admitting that you don't know shit. But it's also showing the self-awareness that you need to be reminded sometimes. So that's okay. So go buy that label maker or get out your sticky notes and remind yourself. Yeah, it doesn't make you a serial killer. <laughs> it just just makes you self-aware. That's really all it is. And so uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there. A really good episode. So on behalf of Rob Reinhold and myself, this is VP for No Nonsense Forex signing off. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays, Rob. Hey, happy holidays. Goodbye, everybody.